Brazil is a fascinating country, one that I don't understand very well. It is a source of extraordinary diversity of people with Africans, indigenous South Americans, Japanese and Europeans all mixing. It's also got one of the world's most advanced economies uh, producing aircraft like Embraer Air and automobile manufacturing, while at the same time containing extraordinary amounts of poverty. It seems like you can find everything in Brazil. When I invested in the for-profit education sector, I also got to know a little bit about some of the extraordinarily sophisticated, smart, thoughtful private equity professionals who are part of the unfolding industrial landscape in Brazil. Some of the more famous ones, of course, are Jorge Paulo Liman, Alex Baring, but uh, there are others. And Ricardo Fernandez is a friend, and I thought that it would be worthwhile to learn more about his experiences in Brazil and in the private equity field. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ricardo. So everyone, it's uh, such a pleasure to be with one of my readers of when you publish a book, you don't know who's going to show up in your life. And in this case, we're with Ricardo Fernandez, who has just told me he's sitting in his home office in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I guess with that introduction, I just want to ask you, first of all, Ricardo, two questions. Hello. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, what's the weather like in Rio? And second of all, how did you come across my book, Blast Away, Ricardo? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for the invite, uh, Guy. Uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm in Rio de Janeiro right now. The weather here is, uh, for Rio standards, very cold. So it's uh, 20 degrees Celsius. So that's uh, unusual, right? Uh, and uh, I actually read your book. I was looking for more information about good uh, or great uh, long uh, only funds uh, and value investors. Uh, and then a friend of mine that I really admire recommended me reading your book. Uh, and uh, the rest is history, right? <laughs> uh, I read it. Uh, I was uh, really interested about the way you put it. I was intrigued for some of the points. And I just thought that I, I needed to ask m myself for you about some of the points in the book. And that's where it all started, right? I sent and, you an email and, and then we, we managed to meet. And so for, for you, the listener, I, it's just such a, you know, I get all sorts of people being in touch with me. And some of them are super interesting, so super interesting that I want to spend time with them on a podcast. And uh, Ricardo, even though you grew up in Brazil, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about where and how you grew up. You studied outside of Brazil, in Spain and in the United States. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how you grew up and how you were educated. That's uh, it's it's not a, a short answer, but uh, I think that uh, it says a lot about uh, myself, right? So I grew up in Brazil, as you described, have a, a great uh, childhood. Uh, my family came from a family of. Uh, uh, expats right they came from from portugal in the beginning of of uh last century and they were all self-made men uh entrepreneurs uh so i i from since i an early age uh, i learned the importance of studying hard uh and and taking risks uh and trying to to give a lot of importance to education and it's why uh, when I was able to, I managed to apply for an MBA abroad, as you mentioned, in Spain, and after uh, to go for the U.S. But I think that there's one story that I, I would like to share with you, and, and I'm pretty sure you and, and the audience will find uh, very interesting. And then I think it's resonates who I am. I, who I am. My grandparent that was born in his first generation Brazilian, uh, was born in the countryside of Brazil. Uh, no money, uh, no money to to buy books. Like it's it's hard to imagine these things nowadays, right? So, uh, was like always self teaching himself about everything, going to school. And when he entered law uh, school, 
there was one book that he thought that was very, very important for him, but he didn't have the money to buy it. So, and this was the countryside of Brazil around 1940s. So he, he didn't have the money to, to, to buy the book. There wasn't a, an Amazon to, to shop online or there was a Google to find a PDF of the book. So he found a copy in the public library of the city. It was like three kilometers from his house and about two kilometers from the university. So he decided that every day after university, he would stop by and he would read the book before going home. At one point, he decided that that wasn't enough just to read the book. He could forget about stuff. He needed the book. And when he was telling me this story, I said, oh, so he just decided to put his book under his, his arm and take it. No, of course not. So he started going to the university every day and copy the book, the entire book was about 600 pages that he copied and there wasn't a, uh, was like ink pen, right? The old style. So he copied 600 pages of a, a book uh, of constitutional law in Brazil. And he tells me that for weeks or months he was doing this job because he couldn't afford to make a mistake. After a month, when the, the book was completed, he said that this was his first competitive, competitive advantage. He knew the book by heart and all the subject by heart. Uh, he became probably uh, one of the most uh, successful and well-known judges in Brazil. Very respected guy, uh, very respected writer as well for not technical stuff, but also uh, uh, romance and, and this type of, of, of things. And our family still have the book. So wow. when I was growing up, uh, every time that I faced some sort of uh, problem, uh, I would remember that uh, he had to, to really earn his way up. And that this is my 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 role. I think that uh, is to try to follow at least even from from far behind uh, his own steps. So this was the type of environment that I grew up. My, my this was my grandfather, and my father also uh, an entrepreneur uh, that put a lot of emphasis on education and all that he managed to get uh, uh, and, 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 and earn in life was through education. So that's, that's why I decided that uh, when I had the chance, I would try to, to study abroad as well. Not sure if I answer your question. but No, uh, it's a, Ricardo, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And I'm always amazed at how when you create the space to have this kind of conversation, you never know where it will go. And one of the things that resonates for me in that story is that there is uh, in uh, the Jewish world an injunction to every Jewish person to uh, to write a Sefer Torah, or to write out a copy of the Bible, or at least the first five books of Moses. And for many uh, observant Jews, the way they meet that obligation is that they pay somebody to write it for them, and they pay a special scribe to write it. But I can tell you that uh, just as an exercise, at a p one point when I was living in New York, I decided to try it out. So every day, I would open up my just my notebook, not any special book, and I kind of tried doing the exercise of just copying out from the Hebrew Bible, writing in Hebrew. And I think that, and my Hebrew is not very good, but I was amazed at how the little that I did, and I'd only did it for a few weeks, my, the, my Hebrew improved so much. And there's something about putting yourself through the process of writing something out it's not just learning, it's meditative, it's all sorts of things. And actually, when I hear you talking about your grandfather, it makes me want to go back to that task or any take any book. I, I actually, reading War and Peace only a couple of years ago had a huge impact on me. And I got a copy of War and Peace in Russian, even though I can't read Russian. And I asked myself the question, if I would set myself the task of copying out the book War and Peace in Russian, what would happen? And I think 
some very interesting and surprising things would happen. And I think that what's really amazing is that, you know, two generations down, and I stop and think to myself, uh, what am I doing today? Or what could I do today? You know, one, one day I might have a grandson, child of my children, you know, who's like Ricardo. And what can I do today? And obviously, I mean, did your grandfather know that he would have such an influence on you? He obviously has had a massive influence. And what, and what is also fascinating by me, for me, is that he had that influence, not because he was some, uh, you know, he wasn't yelling at people, he wasn't shooting at people, he wasn't accomplishing any feats that would be impossible for any person to. He just went into a library every day and copied out a book. And that's, I mean, just think of that for what, for what will I be remembered, for what will re you be remembered, or the listener and maybe the simple act of copying out a book is what one can be remembered for is just a fascinating idea, which I really appreciate. And I just want to ask you, so uh, I know that you're now in Rio. Did your family all, always live in Rio? No, my family comes from, from this uh, state called Minas Gerais, that it's in the countryside. Uh, and then my, my parents uh, came to Rio uh, when I was like three years old. Uh, so my father to to work uh, and 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 my mother with him. So that's I'm I'm first generation carioca, like we said. Uh, and do you have any connection to Minas Gerais anymore? Or? Yes, yes. Like part of my family still live there, and from time to time uh, I go and visit. And then, so I I just have a question for you. So I visited Bahia, I visited Rio, and I visited um, São Paulo. And the, the cultures of Rio de Janeiro and, and Sao Paulo are so different. And actually, I would find it far easier to be in business in Sao Paulo than, than Rio de Janeiro. But perhaps you can explain for me the difference in cultures. How, cario, how do you say it? Cariocas? Cariocas, yes. Cariocas see the San Paulinas, however they call it, and vice versa. How does that world... And for the listener, if you've not been to Brazil... I mean, there are, there are at least two countries in the world. China is also the same, but you go to India and realize that India, you can spend a whole lifetime in India and not discover all the things that are in India. And the same with Brazil. You can spend a whole lifetime in, in Brazil and discover languages and cultures you never knew existed. So we're just like scratching the surface, but tell us about the differences. Yeah, I think that the, the, the general perception is that in Rio, things are a little bit more relaxed. Uh, because of the, you have the sea, you ride the beach, you have like a lot of um, sports, uh, people doing sports uh, all year. But I think that Sao Paulo, it's where people can relate as a more business uh, oriented uh, environment. So it's in the end, even though I live in Rio and my office, it's, it's in Rio, headquarters in Rio, I end up spending at least two or three days per week in Sao Paulo, right? Because there's where things really happen. So you have to you have to learn how to live with with the Paulistas, that's how we call the, the people from Sao Paulo. And you have to to be patient with people from Rio because in the end you have to come back at home, right? Uh, and, and you have to to learn that although you can say that you live in the most beautiful city in the world, you end up working uh, in Sao Paulo. But it's not a disadvantage for you in inside. In Brazil, it's not a disadvantage if you live in Rio, but spend three days a week in Sao Paulo. No, it's like uh, you have a lot of you have a lot of people from from the investment management industry that that lives in Rio. So you have a good hub here. And it's not a disadvantage because it's a 40, 40 minute flight very easy to go and come back on the same day but in reality is that when you go to sao paulo you try to pack your your agenda and, and meet as many people as you can uh yeah. in just two or three days but and i think that with the pandemic things got a little bit easier as well because you have zoom right uh you can video conference with people so instead of going every week now i'm going like every two weeks so, you know, one, I know that one of your first uh, jobs was in uh, Geneva. And um, 
you know, so so I kind of see the difference between Sao Paulo and Rio is a bit like between Geneva and Zurich. And um, Geneva is a little more relaxed. It's probably a little more beautiful. But, you know, the funny thing is, is that I, I hate to tell you, Ricardo, if I was in Brazil, I'd live in I'd live in Sao Paulo. I love that place. And it's funny, I, I would tell you that uh, there's also a similarity in Australia between Sydney and Melbourne. Both cities are about equal sizes. And even though I love the beach and I love I love the sea, I find the atmosphere in Sao Paulo to be something really special for me. And I find Rio de Janeiro to be a bit of a mess, sort of like good for a holiday, but not much more. Um, similarly, Sydney is a beautiful, beautiful city, but there's something, and it's on the beach and everything, but something about Melbourne just really gets to me. There's a kind of a seriousness about it. And obviously you saw that in Switzerland, I made my choices uh, and came to Zurich and we, there was no chance in hell that we would ever live, have ever lived in Geneva, much as it's nice to visit. But perhaps I can ask you about how you ended up in the world of finance and perhaps that job in Geneva has something to do with it. Yes, no, uh, of course. So, so as as you said, like uh, I, I I had a, a summer internship in Geneva uh, while I was in my my doing my MBA, and of course this like triggered my my interest not only to to the, the world of finance but most especially to the uh, world of alternatives, alternative investing. So when I came back from my MBA, uh, a friend of mine was setting up. Uh, a family office that has ties to a to a small Swiss bank, and he needed someone to help him in setting up the alternatives arm of the family office, the, the part that would take care of the liquid assets of it of his clients. And then for me it was once in a lifetime uh, opportunity, right, to join a friend that I admire. Uh, that was setting up something really special and to have this type of, 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 of opportunity to create from the scratch an area. So that was, I think, the, the beginning of my, my road, right, that, that brought me to where I am today. So back then, I started researching on the big firms that were providing alternative advisory uh, for clients or that was providing uh, what we call fund of funds, right, uh, in alternatives for private equity. And I did my research. I found out that in Switzerland was actually the, the home of two or three of the, the, the most famous uh, asset managers uh, in this space. And I decided to cold call uh, one of them uh, and propose to do something together in partnership with us in Brazil. And, and to my surprise, they accepted. And it's where it all started. So I started like as a as this joint venture with this with this Swiss asset manager firm uh, and this family office. But one year down the road, and my friend and my boss, that was my boss, right, decided that uh, he, he didn't want to work with the Swiss anymore. And he told me, hey, I'm not working with, 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 the, with the Swiss bank anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward on my own. But all my clients that may have an opportunity to invest with you are not coming with me. So <laughs> you're better off if you just stay with this, this firm that it just started up this joint venture and stay in the area that you want, right? And that's where well all started. So we set up the, the office for this Swiss asset manager like in 2009 in Brazil. We started like fundraising in Brazil. Back then it was a, a nightmare, right? To do it in Brazil. Like nobody knew the concept of uh, private equity in Brazil or private equity fund of funds. Nobody knew anything about the secondary market in the private equity uh, space. So it was like a lot of bootstrapping, uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurial uh, struggle, as I, as I can tell you, because we were not getting a lot of support from this, from this firm. 
but we managed to put a fund uh, together. But for reasons that maybe it's better for us to skip, we decided that uh, this firm, the Swiss firm was not the best home for our project in Brazil. Mm. And that's when we cold call again an American firm called Hamilton Lane, and we proposed them to open an office in Brazil. And we were lucky enough to find a, a, a Spanish guy that was running uh, Hamilton Lane out of Asia. So you could relate, right? It's a, a, a Latino as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, same type of, uh, of culture. And he was very receptive to our, to our proposal. And we engaged in conversations. And in 2011, we opened a Hamilton Lane office in Brazil. So I joined the firm to set up the office with them. And there was a person that was responsible for all the business development part of the business because the, uh, and I was responsible for the investment part of the business for them. So I guess many questions, but one question is when you say cold call, maybe you can share with us exactly what the cold call entailed because for a Brazilian guy with an MBA from a Spanish business school, to quote cold call firms in say Switzerland or the United States, even with an MBA is still, you know, I'm curious to hear how you did that because obviously it worked. And then I guess, you know, after that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how Hamilton Lane, well, none of the listeners will know about Hamilton Lane, so you might have to explain a little bit, but let's, let's just start with the cold calls. What did that actually entail? Where did you get the idea to do it? Who coached you how to do it? All of those things. No, this was the you no know, very very good question, and, and people re always ask me if that's true. Uh, it is, uh, and, and 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 the person that received the call can confirm. But uh, <laughs> and was it literally a phone call? Was was no? Was an email? Started as an email, uh, and of course, we we spent a lot. Like I had this partner, right, and we spent a lot of time. Uh, trying to figure out what would be what would be the most effective way to get their attention. So we brainstorm probably for a, a four line email. We brainstorm for like a couple of weeks. Uh, to be honest uh, with you, and you try to say what we we have to tell them: the opportunity, the opportunity size for them to open in Brazil. Why now? And why with us? Yeah, in four lines, uh, standing on one leg before yeah, they delete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we started with a very big, uh, uh, very big letters with this, the, the opportunity size, right, of, of the alternative space in Brazil for both not only on, with the investment point of view, but also on the LP side, right? the size of the institutional investors in Brazil, uh, they are huge. Uh, uh, and then, of course, why now? So we set up uh, a couple of information around uh, macro of Brazil back then, uh, all the big events that were supposed to happen in Brazil, like the Olympics, the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup. Uh, you had the, the pre-salt that was like uh, those huge oil discoveries uh, in the coast of Brazil. So we tried to create an environment of a, of a boomy market and a boomy opportunity for them. And then why us? And then it was like a, a good combination uh, of culture, right? We did a lot of research uh, on the culture of the firm, but also uh, that we were a team, right? We, ha we have a person that was responsible for all the business development, that was this, this partner of mine, and then myself that was responsible for the investment part, and that we have a team in place. So it was almost like a plug and play for them uh, to open yeah. their office in, in Brazil. And so how many emails did you send and how many responses did you get? How many phone calls? Tell us about the funnel. We sent uh, two emails. Two, two, two emails, two answers, one phone call. One phone call. Wow. In the world of direct email, that's a very, very high response rate, you know. Yes, 
And we were lucky, I think, of course. There was a component that was pure luck and, and mm-hmm. right time. And so when we talk about Hamilton Lane, were there any other firms that were interesting for you? Did you did you kind of research them before you sent them your cold emails? Yeah, we, we researched a lot because uh, we didn't want to have the situation that we had with our existing employer that was not a fully committed uh, to the to the to the project in Brazil. So we did a lot of research with the, the firms first that we have some sort of uh, cultural alignment with them, but also that has the balance sheet uh, to invest because in the end, they would need to perceive Brazil as their own private equity investment, right? With a J-curve, so they would need to invest for a couple of years to start having some returns out right. of like three, four years down the road. So, so perhaps you can describe uh, Hamilton Lane for me and for the listener and how the relationship evolved. And, and for the listener's interest, uh, Ricardo is now um, uh, uh, independent with Signal Capital, but uh, tell, us, tell us about how you selected, wh- how, which firms met your criteria and then how the re- who Hamilton Lane are and how the relationship evolved. Yeah, I think that, of course, uh, our top choice, uh, it, was, it was Hamilton Lane. I think that uh, our criteria was like, uh, in the end, this is a people business, right? And, and you need to feel comfortable uh, and you need to admire the people that you're working with or that you're going to work for. So you can have like a, a, someone uh, to inspire you to be the best that you can every day. And I think that Hamilton had a, a very, uh, is, is a very emblematic firm, in my opinion, right? Because it has a, a great leadership, a very like, humble uh, and a knowledgeable person as, as, as their CEO. And, it, and it's also a very fun place to work with because you're, you're working with normal people, right? Uh, with, with highly committed, but normal people. Uh, and I think that's exactly the way of place that I like to work with. So it was the only choice to be, to be 100% honest with you back then. And it was a, 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 a very easy process. So we had like a couple of meetings, right, between senior management there and our team here in Brazil. We made a trip that was for me very important to their headquarters in the U.S. also to have the chance to, to meet uh, in one day like 20 people. Uh, and when you enter the, when you enter in Hamilton Lane, at least the old office, the old headquarters, you, you start realizing that you're in a different place. Why? In one of the floors, uh, all the meeting rooms are named after famous guitar players. <laughs> and the other, and in the other floor, uh, the, the, the rooms are named after famous guitar brands. So you have the Fender room, you have the Gibson room, you have like uh, the Van Halen room. So it's uh, you realize that you are in a in a different place. And also on and on the when you're going to towards where the investment teams are located in the floor, you see a picture of all the beneficiaries on the client side, right? So the teachers, the firemen, the policemen, the doctors, they are the final clients. Uh, and that sh- tells you that in the end of the day, your, your work is that they can safeguard their futures, right? You're managing their pensions, you're managing, uh, and not, you're not just managing the money for a, a high net worth or for a Wall Street guy. You're managing the pension funds for those type of people. That in the end gives also a, a, a sense of purpose that for me is very important uh, when you're committed to a long-term project or a long-term uh, investment goal. That's 
And and just for the listener, because uh, Ricardo may be assuming that we know far more than we actually do, Hamilton Lane is a U.S.-based manager of alternative investments. Uh, with uh, what are the AUM now, Ricardo? I would guess that it's close to seven hundred seven hundred billion. Oh, so probably. so, I mean, BlackRock is perhaps two trillion. But it's 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 not that small actually. I mean, seven hundred billion is is a very very serious number of assets. It's a big institutional player basically, and they actually happen to be publicly traded. Now, Ricardo, did you did you work at all? And their headquarters are in Conshohocken, uh, Pennsylvania. And I I've been to Conshohocken actually. I did a course in Conshohocken. In case anybody, that must be an American Indian name. But uh, did you live in Conshohocken? Did you 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 just did on visits? No, like uh, they, they they just moved to this office. Uh, the, the the old one was in a, a, another another city called Balakinwood, uh, mm. uh, and I would go there like two or three times per year and spend one or two weeks, uh, but uh, never never leave there. Right, but what comes clear, and maybe it's got to do with your grandfather is that you're extremely committed to Brazil because I think that some people with your abilities and education might have chosen to have an international career. You probably received opportunities and job offers to work in Spain, to work in New York, London, but you chose not to go that route. Uh, can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes, I, I think that uh, you, you're right. I think that a lot of that is because I, I still need to give back uh, in, 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 in Brazil, right? And, and that's why I think that where I can make the difference the most with my job and with my knowledge and with everything that I learned, not only from uh, formal education, right? But my, my life experience and of entrepreneurship or to making bridges between companies and countries. I can add more value being in Brazil and I can give back more, uh, not only of my, and, and when I say give back more, it's not only about money, but also time experience, right? And sharing more than if I would be like living in, in Switzerland or in the UK, I would be just another Brazilian guy living abroad. And, and why I think that here I can make the difference. That's uh I'm I'm really committed with Brazil again. That's right. the, that's the problem. Do you, or or a benefit and um, yeah, to have a sense that sense of identity and purpose that goes far beyond your um, investment activities. So I want to get into the mechanics of your business, but before we go there, or you can decide, should we go into the mechanics of your business first, or should we go to the buyout from uh, from Hamilton Lane? No, we can we can go to the we can go to the buyout. So seven or eight years with Hamilton Lane, the um, I'm sure that gave you enormous credibility with American investors, and then Hamilton Lane decide that Brazil's not investable anymore or something. <laughs> Tell us how that works. Yeah, so I, I joined the firm uh, in 2011, and and as you as you mentioned, was a very interesting uh, experience. The company went public in 2017 so i had this experience of uh joining a a, a private company and going through the process of of, of becoming a, a a public listed company that was a uh, very very uh exciting uh, to say the least and in 2019 2020 i started like having discussions with with senior management uh at hamilton lane on on about what my future would be in the firm right and there was like a lot of people to ask for a lot of people to talk to uh, but in the end in reality what i really wanted was to stay in brazil and to have more and more capital to deploy because i thought that there was a lot of very interesting investment opportunities in Brazil, and, and I still believe that. But uh, Hamilton Lane wanted to focus more 
and I think that they were they were they were right right to, to focus more in other geographies where you didn't have uh, crazy politics or volatilities going around or people putting fire on the Amazon uh, and things like that to have uh, this type of risks right and the discussions went around what I could add in value if I would relocate to another office and what I would really love to, to do, right? And, and the final answer was always that I would like to have more capital, to invest more in Brazil, and also to invest more in Latin America. Uh, right. And not the other way around. Because uh, another path could have been for you to move around. I mean, I, I can imagine that you might have ended up in the senior management of Hamilton Lane, but in order to do that, you would have had to probably spend time. In, I mean, Hamilton Lane, I just saw on the website, has 18 offices around the world. You would have had to spend time, get experience in the, in the whole firm, and you would have ended up in the senior management team in, um, in Concha Hocken at this point. But your choice yeah. was, no, I just want to do Brazil, man. Yeah, I just want to do Brazil and, and Latin America, right? right. Uh, a small region, small region of the world. Right. Uh, and, and I think that they were, they were very good discussions. There was a lot of learning for me during those discussions uh, because you were forced, right, to think what you really want to do. If you right. want to uh, uh, continue there. And at one point... I saw an opportunity to introduce something that I had been thinking a lot about. And I said, hey, uh, maybe we could both benefit from, from this situation and we can explore a way that I would buy the Brazilian business. Right, which they went for, obviously. Yeah, and, and they said deal in, in, in less than five seconds. Really? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, but but it was it was a very easy it was a very easy discussion because this would solve a lot of a lot of potential problems for both, right? If you think that in Brazil it's hard to open a, a to to set up a company, you don't believe the nightmare that it is to close a company, and especially when you're highly regulated, like asset managers are in Brazil, it's never an easy process, right? So. It, in the end, it was beneficial for both of us that I bought the Brazilian part of the business. So the, the two funds that we have raised before from local institutional investors, and also that I find a solution for the team, right? Because we had back then, we had like five people down in Brazil uh, that were all part of the, of the broader organization, but... If the company decided to 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 leave the country, they would be left behind, right? As well. So this was a good a good combination to continue a work that I started with them in 2011. So there was no disruption on the investment cycle of our two prior funds, right? The team stayed the same. We continue to have a very good relationship with Hamilton Lane, right? Because now Hamilton Lane is an investor right. of our funds, right? Of, of, of all of our funds. And we can still be a good partner. So if they have any questions or if they need to diligence or if they need uh, to originate or to find something about someone in Brazil, they know that they can rely on me. Right. And call me. So was a, and for me the same, right? To do it in, in very good terms, again, helped me a lot to set up my business, even on a solo flight, right? Even right. without them. And I had the support uh, of a lot of people in senior management that had the chance to work with me for the last 10 years. So they knew that I was uh, uh, for real as well. So. so just to talk a little bit macro, 
what is since the buyout what is the flow of funds into brazil in your domain what does it look like and somewhere in the middle there you got a you you got a degree you got an mba from harvard business school which i'm sure didn't hurt anything and maybe you want to talk about that but has has fund flow into brazil in general not necessarily just with you has it dried up and if so why specifically yeah no i had a i had the chance uh and, and also with like with the backing of course of 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 hamilton Lane, i had the chance to go for an amp uh, at harvard business school so the advanced management program and it was a transformational experience for me because uh, i had the chance to write leave in campus for two months and also to to pause uh my my work uh for the similar amount of time and to really think about the next step and really think about what i was going to do next and of course but i, I think that you 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 know that right you are an mba uh, alumni right yeah um, so you have the chance to to live uh with in your living group right with six and seven people from all over the world and those guys became my sounding board i'll say every time that i have an important decision to make is with them that i try to connect and i try to get their inputs uh and and has been very very helpful for me so going back to your to your question of of the funds going into brazil since the since the acquisition of the business last year of course there was a not only the pandemic like hurt a lot that the perception on how brazil was dealing with the pandemic was even worse mm -hmm. right for new money coming into brazil and the macro didn't help but the fundamentals in my opinion are are here and if you look to our performance uh in the last uh fund one that is a 2013 and fund two that is a 2018 they continue to perform really well even in dollar terms yeah but uh, that being said in the end what hurts the most in brazil especially when you're looking to into private equity and not only Brazil, Latin America as a whole, is that you have the lowest DPI in the whole world, right? So the money comes in and you have very, very long holding periods. Uh, you, you, DPI, can you explain DPI? It's distributed paid in capital, right? So is the, is the money, right? You invest uh, 100 in Brazil now uh, and you get... Uh, 50 uh, in five years is a 0.5. Right. right. It's a is a is a is a metric that you 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 kind of measure the the money that comes back to you. And you're saying that in Brazil it's the it's the lowest. Latin America. Why is that? I think it's it's a little bit of the the depth of the market, right? Uh, but also a lot of macro uh and volatility over the years i mean just so, again for the listener and you're going to correct me and expand so uh, brazil is the largest market in latin america if i'm not mistaken the population is 120 million people in brazil 200 200 forgive me uh in mexico is the second largest for some people, so you have to say Latin America, not South America. Mexicans get very upset if you say South America, they're North yeah. America. But but Mexico has a population of about 100 million. And, you know, for what it's worth, uh, Brazil is a, a, in a certain way a, a hard place to understand for the following reason, or for me to get my brain around, because, yes, there are vast proportions of the population that live subsistence farming uh, and basically don't have any disposable income uh, but you also have advanced manufacturing so when i was an investor in fiat the largest fiat factory 
And the one that they were most proud of was in Brazil. Uh, you have companies like Embraer. There's an advanced aerospace uh, manufacturer. Probably all of us have flown in an Embraer jet. So um, uh, Brazil is a huge producer of iron ore and steel for exports and has great uh, local supplies of the raw materials to make steel, unlike other other countries. So it's a it's a very diverse and advanced economy. Uh, and then at the same time, Brazil uh, has uh, so many people who live on the subsistence level and has, from the, my perspective, while it has a stable legal system, it also has very unpredictable politics. Although perhaps we can now say that places like the United States and the United Kingdom also have unpredictable politics. And, and for what it's worth, I think that you know an interesting measure is has a country defaulted on its debt in the past. You know Argentina is probably the worst performer in Latin America on that, and and then there are some countries in the world, even ones that have had crises like South Korea, that has never actually done a default on its debt. But that creates a, a mixed investment investing environment. And while I'm at it, uh, you know I'm going to add some more, and for for the listeners' interest. Ricardo is writing notes, so I feel like I can continue because then I'm going to stop and allow Ricardo to address and expand on all of these points. So in addition to uh, some very advanced industries, Brazil, and, and you know, we can also talk about sports where it's a, you know, it's a global, it dominates in soccer and in other areas. Um, but some of the world's greatest investors have come out of Brazil. So those of us who are of a, a value investing bent uh, are all uh, very impressed with Jorge Paulo Liman and his partners at 3G and anybody who manages to get a partnership with Warren Buffett. And it's really extraordinary that a multinational that started in Brazil is now um, uh, the world's largest beer manufacturer, even though they, it's no longer based out of Brazil, it has its roots in Brazil. So, you know, uh, Ricardo's nodding furiously. And obviously you've heard people like me give all of these kind of sound bites on Brazil and you probably have been in many presentations so now now tell us you know expand on those points tell me what I got wrong and tell me what I still need to get still need to learn no like uh, you, you you mentioned it all uh, and and I think that's it's you're totally right it's Brazil it's a very and, and that's why I think it's so exciting to to really invest in Brazil and to understand uh, Brazil and also broader Latin America, because people tend to, to just divide countries that are Portuguese speaking, like Brazil and all the Spanish speaking countries in Latin America. But in reality is that you have uh, a much more complex and diverse space, right? Mexico is totally different than, than Chile, than Colombia, and then Peru, uh, and then to Brazil. But I think that in Brazil, uh, and, and all the countries in, in Latin America have the opportunity to really arbitrage the geography, right? And see what is working in one of those countries and try to just uh, implement or to look to similar companies in other countries. And I think that if you look to Brazil, for example, it's a very good uh, uh, trendsetter for what will happen in Colombia and Peru or even sometimes in Mexico. Of course, different dynamics, different uh, 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 macro drivers, but in, in the end, the same direction. And I think that I had the chance to learn a lot about when investing uh, for uh, a global institutional uh, investors like my, my predecessor firm, like Hamilton Lane, I had the opportunity to learn how a really, how a real global investor look uh, to those opportunities, and how to separate and how to allocate uh, capital between them. And then when you look to Brazil, uh, that's of course where where I'm based and where I can explain more. You also have to add. You mentioned the politics. You mentioned the entrepreneurs. You mentioned the the sports, uh, and and of course the culture, right? Uh, you have a very strong entrepreneurial culture in Brazil. That's what I think that drives a lot of very successful uh, companies uh, to be globally recognized. 
but also that brings a lot of to very successful investors uh, in Brazil. And, and the most difficult for someone from abroad is that it's almost impossible for you to, to be successful investing in Brazil, doing fly in and fly out from New York or from London or from Switzerland. You really need to be on the ground uh, and you really need to do your homework uh, and your diligence over extended period of time. And that's what, what I think uh, international investors get wrong when they come to Brazil because they're looking to a very limited time frame, right? They're looking for a three months or a six months or even sometimes one year window. And for me, when you, people ask me, what do you think is going to happen in the next presidential election? Right? Of course, I'm, I want them to happen. If possible, I want to have a, a alternation. I want to have new people coming in and out all the time. But if you think about the 10-year period, that's the time that my funds last, I'm going to see at least two more presidents coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So I don't, that's where, why, why I picked the name Signal, right? You have to clear the noise right. about everything that is happening around Brazil, like fire in the Amazon, uh, crazy politics uh, all over, and really focus on the signal that the companies and the entrepreneurs are sending uh, to you. So it's, it's what uh, exciting, excites me the most about Brazil is that it's, a, it's a, a lot of opportunities if you really know where to look at and if you're able to clear all the noise and focus on what really matters. Yeah. Not sure if I answer you, but I have a <laughs> lot of notes here on Mexico, on, on Latin America. On, on <laughs> and for what it's worth, now that you're outside of... Um... Hamilton Lane, your focus is Brazil, because I understand in Hamilton Lane, you were, it was um, Latin America. And now your focus is Brazil. So you don't have any more trips to Chile, Peru. I'm, I'm focused in Brazil, but I'm still uh, looking to invest in other countries in Latin America. So probably uh, we're looking to some opportunities in Mexico, but mm -hmm. always with a local partner. Yeah. I think that my, my experience of being, it's not like I've spent a lot of time in China, but my experience of being in Beijing, Shanghai, uh, and also my experience of being in Sao Paulo and Rio, and you could probably say the same about uh, uh, my experiences in Bombay and Delhi, is that if you live, and it, you know, Switzerland is a bubble, but you know, if you live in the United States or in the United Kingdom or somewhere in Western Europe or Switzerland, um, you, you, it's hard to understand what's happening in the rest of the world because th that that's the rich world and represents a minority. And what you have in Brazil is you can see kind of all sorts of products and services developing for lower middle income people. And so, you know, th that's something that I think is also interesting that I have a friend who's a global investor in Peru. He lives in Peru. And my argument to him is that he is he is in many ways better placed to understand what is happening on the planet than somebody who's living in London, Zurich, or New York. And it, you know, I brought up soccer, but soccer in a certain way exemplifies that because you know I'm five minutes away from the global headquarters of soccer, the FIFA headquarters. Yeah. And yes, there are some amazing teams in the UK and elsewhere in Europe, but. Soccer is a is a phenomenon that is perhaps best understood from the perspective of Brazil. And, you know, if you learn about tennis, you're going to be learning about the rich world. It's mainly people from the rich world that win at tennis, whereas most of the soccer stars are people from lower middle income countries. But and so if, if uh, I don't know if I, there was a question there, it was just a comment uh, for the listener's yeah. interest. Ricardo was nodding. <laughs> I don't know if you no, wanted no, to no, say no, anything. Yeah. No, uh I think that that's the point that you made about Peru. I think it's it's uh, exactly the point that I made before. That, uh, like for example, I, I saw in Peru like very successful investors, kind of 
looking to Brazil, seeing what was working in Brazil, the type of deals that other private equity funds were doing in Brazil, consolidating sectors, and, and they can kind of almost like they have a time machine, right? They can replicate learning from what went right and what went wrong in those other geographies and replicate because it's everything's to be done there in those in those countries, right? If you look to, to, to Brazil, you have you have inside Brazil many Perus and many Colombians and and, and, and so that's what, what really excites me. Like we have one, one of the investments that we have in the northeast of Brazil with a very successful uh, GP as a partner is in a clinic medical clinics targeting low income of Brazil. And when you talk to the entrepreneur, he tells you that what gave him the idea is that in Brazil you have a very, like it's a, it's very expensive to have to have a, a health insurance in Brazil, right? And this founder, he was the son of doctors, and he would sit in the clinic that was owned by his par by his parents, and he would look like people arriving by in, in nice cars taking the, the health insurance card and paying almost nothing for, for an exam. And then he will look to people coming by public transportation with no access to, to health insurance and having to pay full price. Right. So like this type of uh, uh, environment or, or discussions, it's gonna be very rare in a developed country, right? for people to do realize that there, there was an opportunity there. Right. Uh, and, and that's what uh, excites me about Brazil. We can, we can have this type of investment and at the same time be investing in a high tech company that just received like billions of dollars of funding of SoftBank or something like that, like uh, the cutting edge of, of technology. You know, I was impressed when I I used to have inve an investment in Estacio Participaciones. I've probably said that the wrong way, but that was a it's a Rio based company. I was always impressed at how so you would have people coming in from um, the hinterlands with uh, so these are first generation city dwellers uh, who maybe would be working washing dishes at one of the hotels on the on the coastline, and then they would be going at the same time they would be going to school. Uh, to study hotelry, for example, hotel management, or maybe uh, kitchen management, kitchen operations. And Estacio would be giving degrees or they would be given diplomas and certificates. And these people would be paying cash, you know, $50 a week for the course or $25 a week for the course. And so there's, there's economics that one wouldn't understand. But before I get into that, or if you want to respond to that, I have up in front of me a, a chart of some of your investments and I just, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can explain a little bit when I just reel off names. So I see here KKR, and I see Patria, and I see Vinci Partners, and I see Morelli, um, Alpha. I see all these names that mean something to me, and also not enough. So, 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 what does your investment universe look like? What are you? What are you? You talked a little bit about what you're excited about, uh, and maybe that is a starting off point, and maybe you can address my investment in Estacio as well while you're at it. Oh, sure. Uh, so, so the way that we invest here is that we try to offer to our investors very good and resilient portfolios in the alternative landscape, right? So we have like funds. So our funds are a combination of primary, secondaries and co-investments. So what is a, a primary investment is just like the, the plain vanilla fund of funds that are used to. So a part of our of our funds, let's say 20%, we invest in other private equity GPs. So because we believe that it is a, an important to diversify, it's important to have uh, exposure uh, to more companies and to more sectors. So we learn more uh, with them. The other two parts that are the majority of the portfolio that represents from 70 to 90% uh, 
the payment of our funds uh, are into co-investments, where we co-invest alongside GPs or industrial groups, right? Successful industrial groups or successful GPs in Brazil in companies. And then you mentioned a couple of them, but uh, I can say, for example, can be a, a, a glue manufacturer like TechBond, can be a fiber optics company like uh, uh, Sumisichi. So co-investing alongside GPs. And the other, and I think that's the most uh, interesting one for me, is the secondary landscape. It's where we provide liquidity to LPs, to investors that want to exit their private equity investments before the end of the life of the fund. So, for example, we invested in a Vinci fund in 2012, uh, their fund two, and now you want uh, to invest more money into your own fund, but you have to wait for your investment in this private equity fund to mature, right? To get your money back, to have the liquidity to invest in your own fund now. But if you know about Signal, you can call me and say, hey, Ricardo, I have this 100 uh, units that I invested in this fund in 2012, and I want to exit before uh, the end of the fund now, what is the price that you pay for me? And I will do a valuation of all the assets inside the portfolio of that fund. And I'm going to say, hey, Guy, I think that it's worth, uh, you have very good investments here, uh, probably it's worth even more than what you invested, but that you can leave now, I'm going to pay you a 10% discount or a 15% discount or sometimes a 50% discount. So I provide liquidity to investors that want to leave before the end of the life of the fund. And there's also the other side of the secondary markets that you can provide this liquidity also to the GP. Because it can be of the benefit of the GP to recycle the capital and to return capital to their investors because maybe he's fundraising his new fund. So he wants to liquidate their past uh, funds portfolio as well. So that's where I think that's the most exciting part uh, of private equity right now in Latin America is the secondary space. And it's of course, is where we are focusing the, the most uh, right now. And so for the listeners' interest, I, I think that I learned an awful lot from Ricardo because I, I, I discovered that, for example, so if, you know, if there's GPs who are in the business of structuring deals, somebody like Ricardo can act as an amplifier. So Ricardo can say to them, hey, show me your deals. And if I like the way it's structured, I won't structure it uh, and I won't potentially even source it. But if you if I like the deal, you can amplify your capital with mine. And there are a thousand different reasons why uh, Ricardo, in addition to the fact that he, for example, one of the services he provides is he provides liquidity to GP partners so to, or to general partners. And so he's seeing deal flow and he's seeing ideas from all over the private equity space. And they all if have an interest, in involving Ricardo, because if it's a company that eventually you want to take public, uh, if it's a company that you eventually want to sell, you, you want to reduce your interest in the company, there are a thousand different ways. So what, what is fascinating as well is that Ricardo is leveraging relationships without necessarily having a structuring team behind him. So he doesn't structure the deals themselves. He looks at other deals that are structured and passes judgment and values them but that means that I can only imagine that your email inbox is jam-packed, full of people who want you to look at their deals. I can also imagine that there are all sorts of um, things that people will tell you privately that they want to make sure that you don't share publicly. So you're a kind of a nexus of influence and knowledge. The limit perhaps is your time to be able to analyze and understand all of these companies. Yeah, like in the end, I have to... like. I there's a good analogy, right? There's a maze. The market is a maze and you have all the different uh, paths inside the maze, right? 
and you have the different GPs and the LPs in this maze. And in my position, I'm sitting on top of it and I can see what everybody's doing, right? right? And, and I, can, I can share, I can share because the minute you broke this uh, trust relationship with the market, right. you're, you're, you're done. <laughs> but you can see and then you can evaluate. So the point that you made is that in the end, a lot of people look for us as a way to confirm their investment thesis and to have an external confirmation of their investment thesis because they know that you're looking to what everybody's doing in the market. And if we decided to engage, at least uh, they hope, uh, probably it's not always true, but they hope that this is a sign that they're doing the right thing and that they caught our attention. And so for your interest, Ricardo won't do this, but uh, I can do this. The chart that I'm looking for is showing an IRR of uh, almost 21% on the 2013 vintage. And um, it, it kind of, it's a fascinating business for me. As you know, I'm, I'm in the public markets. But if, uh, if one day I was involved in private companies, I'd be looking for the, uh, in any market that I was involved with, I was be, I'd be looking for the Ricardo Fernandez of that market because it would give me enormous insight. And I think that on, on one level, it's, you know, it's hard for me to accept that so much is going on that is not visible to somebody like me who invests in public markets. At the same time, I accept it. And it's a kind of a whole new set of amount of knowledge for me to understand this secondary market, which is utterly fascinating. Ricardo, I want to ask you two more questions. I want to hear about how you ended up developing your relationship with Pactual, BTG Pactual. And then uh, I, I, I want to know how, if anybody's interested, if they want to get in touch with you, how they get in touch with you. So... Uh, after after the the transaction, right, uh, the, the the buyout where we bought the business um, in Brazil from Hamilton Lane, uh, we start conversations with uh, several groups because the type of investor that we have, institutional investors, right, lo both local and international, it was very important also to show them that we have uh, we continue to have a good infrastructure to serve, right? Uh, a, a big institutional investor. And BTG Pactual was a, was a very clear choice for us because the, like probably the, the leading investment bank in the region, in Latin America, and they have also a very strong presence abroad. So they could help us to open some doors uh, in Europe, Asia, and in the US. And we end up selling for them uh, a minority stake last year. Uh, and now they're our partners. We are independent. They don't have any, any say in our investment process. But of course, they help us a lot uh, with deal flow, with distribution of our products into their high net worth uh, client base, and also back office. Uh, so we can really stay focused uh, on what matters most for us, that is our investment process. Thank you. And I, I just continue to be impressed by how you have successfully engaged the institutional world. Uh, you know, people like Hamilton Lane, uh, people in Switzerland, uh, people like BTG Pactual. But, you know, and, and, and I still don't feel, and I, I apologize to the listener for this, there's something, as you can see, that's pretty special about Ricardo, because while at the same time being uh, capable of generating trust and from the institutional world, Ricardo has maintained his independence. So many people in Ricardo's shoes would have ended up being part of the management of the institutional world. But something in your genes, Ricardo, and maybe it goes back to your grandfather who was a judge, decides to maintain his independence but is capable of maintaining that relationship with the institutional world i think if i look to my own life at the point when i went independent i kind of accepted that my ties to any kind of institutional structures would be would be cut perhaps never to be replaced and i think in my case 
I don't really have a connection. I, I when up to 2008, I did have some institutional investors, but now the every single one of my investors is is an entrepreneur. But and so I kind of respect the fact that you've been able to maintain you you kept your independence and you have you're part of the institutional world, which is kind of very impressive to me. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Oh, yes. And, and, and I think that, uh, believe it or not, I think that I told you this before, but uh, the conversation that we had last March, when was still like, on, was it all, all this was a, an empty page that you mentioned to me that I should push for staying independent, even though there was a lot of like a potential uh, opportunities to not stay independent, and it was very helpful for me. So uh, I know there's a side comment, uh, almost like an inside joke, uh, but it's true. Uh, so uh, for the for the listeners' interest, uh, Ricardo visited uh, me in my office. Uh, I think it was just a, a month or two into the pandemic, while one still could travel. And I think, Ricardo, that that was just me projecting. But I stop and think, and it's not like I, um, you know, I've met Georges Lehmann a couple of times. I can't say I have a close relationship with him. But I asked him myself when he was, uh, I think he was part of the management of Garantia Bank, how many times a big institution would have tried to buy them and how many times he would have said thanks but no thanks, you know? And so you follow. I think you're following in his footsteps in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> but so, lastly, Ricardo, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. If somebody listening wants to get in touch with you, uh, maybe they want to invest with you. Maybe they just have thoughts. What is the what are the best channels for them to do? What what are the places? I mean, you have a Twitter account. Do you pay attention to it? Should they contact you on LinkedIn? How how should they find you? Like you can find me on LinkedIn. For sure, uh, I try to be responsive, so uh, I promise I'll answer. Uh, it can take a, a couple of days sometimes, but I will answer all the all the inquiries. Uh, so it's the easiest way, or they can find me through our web page as well. So signalcapital.com.br, and uh, there's my my contacts there as well. Yeah. Can I ask you one question? Of course you can. You can ask as many questions as you like, Ricardo. Just while you prepare that question, um, on LinkedIn, he doesn't have an easy address, but it's Ricardo-Fernandez-Jr. And then there is uh, 0B75457, but you'll find him. He's at Signal Capital. Now, now, Ricardo, you want to ask me a question, blast away. Yeah, no, so what have you been reading? <laughs> Ricardo, um, uh, what I, I have more books that I want to read than I can read, obviously, at all times. Um, and uh, the book that I'm working my way through that's on my bedside table every day is David Copperfield by um, uh, Charles Dickens. I've set a goal for myself to be reading. I have a list of uh, sort of world classics that uh, I'm trying to read all the time. And I've just written a review of a book that was written by a friend. Dory Clark has written a book called The Long Game, How to Play, How to Play the Long Game, uh, which I think is a wonderful book full of great ideas. But I think that, and I, I enjoyed the book very much, and it, by the time the listener hears this, I will have published a review of it uh, on my newsletter. But I, I think that... So many of the life lessons that I want to learn are nuanced and are better learned by reading novels, which require or reading reading classic novels like War and Peace, like David Copperfield. And I feel like uh, too many of us business people do not spend enough time reading the classics of world literature. And so David Copperfield is by my desk, but I was also reading The Long Game, and I'm about to read and review a book by another. Friend, um, it's called Soul in the Game by Vitaly Katzel Nelson. That hasn't yet come out, but um, it's got some rave reviews, including by my friend Rolf de Belli, who's just blurbed it. But how did I do, Ricardo? What are you reading? So 
uh, I'm, I'm reading the the latest book of uh, Kai Fu, Kai Fu Li, the 2041. Uh, but I'm, I'm just just starting. Uh, looks really interesting the way he's putting stuff. But I like to read uh, also some like World War II type of books, uh, trying to learn uh, how all that happened uh, and, and things like that. So I'm kind of all around when reading. Not a lot of Brazilian uh, classical, uh, but that's that's it. The, the latest of Kai Fu Li is, is one that I'm reading, and I have like two or three here on my on my side that it's on the, on the list of to read. Yes, but not sure if I'm going to read it before. Yes, I hear you. <laughs> I'll check it out. The, any, the I'm be- looking at. Capital Allocation, The Financials of a New England Textile Mill, 1955 to 1985. Who's that by? It's by Jacob McDowell. Okay. <laughs> Good job, just man. Just like brand new, just, just arrived. It's here. But uh, uh, but I think that this 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 latest from Kai Fu is really interesting, right? I read the first one, AI, Superpowers. And for me, it was very interesting. Uh, and now I'm reading this new one that's... Uh, looks interesting as well and just for the listeners interest i believe ricardo you're coming to value x this year it do, are there any other events that you attend where somebody might find you either in brazil or do you plan to come to the berkshire hathaway meeting or there are other meetings where people can find you yeah no like before before the pandemic uh i would go to a lot of those conferences around emerging markets uh, in Latin America, like uh, Latin America Venture Capital Association, uh, that used to be every year in in, in September. Uh, this year, as I said, next year I'm going to go to the Value X. Uh, I'm excited to go, uh, and that's it. In, in Brazil, I try to 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 stay under the radar, uh, working uh, and not attending to a lot of events. And with that in mind, I'm very grateful to you, Ricardo, that you took the time to interview with me and to share some of your insights and wisdom. It's been really fun. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.